In 2013, Robert Gilbreth wrote a book entitled, a mystery novel. He wrote a book entitled, Cuckoo Calling. It was published by a very prominent publishing house and released in the spring of 2013, and it sold just a few books. By July the 7th, that week, on Amazon, it sold worldwide 43 books. The very bottom of the Amazon list virtually. The week of July the 14th, a week later, that same book sold over 18,000 copies and they couldn't get enough for the demand and it soared to the top of the Amazon best-selling list. What happened? What happened? 43 books, bottom, bang, top, inside of a week. What happened? It was discovered that Gilbreth did not write the book. That was a pseudonym. It was written by somebody called J.K. Rollings, who wrote Harry Potter. And it changed how everybody reviewed the book how they thought about the book, and somebody, everybody then had to have a copy of the book. What was the difference, ladies and gentlemen, between Galbraith and Rawlings? What was the difference? Same book. What was the difference? Absolutely nothing except name and recognition, name and recognition. In the right side of culture, name and recognition is all, all important, isn't it? Name, recognition. In the upside culture of the church, Name and recognition aren't particularly important if they are important at all because there is an equality in the body of Christ that makes name and recognition not the thing that is most sought after by a million miles as it is in the secular cultural world. That's exactly what was happening in Corinth in the first century. That's exactly what Paul was writing to, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to instruct Corinth, the church and the city, how to live in a broken world, in a society that was totally messed up, and we're going to see how crazy and confused Corinth was and how the city of Corinth had bled all the way into the church of Corinth, the body of Christ in Corinth. And we're going to see how then we are to live with divine instruction in a world, in a nation that is in big, big trouble. Everybody says, what can I do? So many say, whoa, we have to stand up. What does that mean? Verbiage or action? We've already been studying 1 Corinthians. I call it 1 Houstonians. We've all been looking at what Paul said in the first three chapters. Now, he's about to get with some big, big, burly, tough, moral problems. We're going to get there in chapter 5. And when we get there, most of us are going to say, oh, that's in the Bible? So hold on. 
But right now, Paul is introducing the Corinthian church and reminding them of who they are and what they have. This is who you are, and this is what you have. That has been what we've been looking at. And we've already seen he's given them some doctrinal foundations upon which to stand. And then our last study in chapter 3, Paul says that, guess who you are as the church? You are a field in which the Word of God is being planted, bang, bang, a field, the church, brothers and sisters in Christ. And he said, the problem is the word is there and it's been planted, but it sure is slow in growing up. I still have to feed you pablum and baby food when you ought to be sitting down to filet mignon. You're not growing up, but you're a field. And then he says, you're a building. And your foundation is solid on the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we say in Texas, you've got a foundation for a skyscraper and you put a chicken coop on top of it. He said, you're not building and growing commensurate to measure the base that has been put in. And then finally, he says about you and me, and this is mind-boggling to me, and I've thought about it, prayed about it, looked at it, staggering. He said, guess what? The church of God, the temple, not just the outer courts, but the very holy of holies where the Shekinah is, is inside you. This is who you are. You're still divided. You're still partial. You're still filled with pride and ego and pushing your way ahead. You've got every kind of immorality you can name, but you're still in deep, deep trouble. And then Paul comes to this great fourth chapter. Remind you, he's still trying to help these people, this church, to understand how they are to function in a totally corrupt society. Isn't that what you and I need to know? Divine insight, divine commandments, divine ability to discern and walk through this world as men and women on God's team. He's telling us, before he gets the specifics, He gets them some very, very general things. Chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. By the way, hope you have your Bible with you. Then break a Bible, look at the Bible in the pew in front of you. Page 131, you'll be right here. Get in a habit. We spoil everybody by putting Scripture on the screens. We may quit that. Bring your Bible with you so you'll get in a habit. We get out of the habit of that. Have the sword with you. I'm going to church. I'm going to take my Bible with you. Didn't bring one. Page 131 for all you men. You'd take too long to find 1 Corinthians. <laughs> but look at it so you can follow along. We'll have it on the screen and help us as we go. Chapter 4. Paul says, That a man regard us, Christians, in this manner. In other words, this is how... The world should look at us in the culture of the church to regard you and regard me as we would Paul and Apollos in the church in Corinth. He says, as servants of Christ, let's stop. That word servant is a pregnant word. What does that mean? It's a very important word. When I read the Bible and study it, I always look for pregnant words. Words that are going to grow and develop and multiply. Key words. Now, right up front, we have a pregnant word. It is the word service. I know that word. Maybe not. The real etymology means you are an under rower. Who am I in Christ? Who are you in Christ? 
who were these Corinthians, they were under rowers and they had those big galleys, those Roman ships, and they'd have those slaves and they would be down motivating that ship. Where Corinth was between the Aegean Sea and the Ionian Sea, that little isthmus that was there, that big bursting international seaport, they had slaves that would row. And, and he says, you don't know who you are? That's a great, you're an under roar. You're an under roar. That's kind of describes who we are. And the Corinthians, man, they didn't like that. You mean we are under roars? We're slaves and the master is mm, commanding us? That's who we are. That's who they were, a Christian. And he says, and a steward of the mysteries of God. A steward means someone who is, doesn't own everything, but is responsible for the whole household, is responsible for everything, a steward. And we are to be stewards. We're under rowers. We're slave of Christ. But also we are those who are stewards who have responsibility and an accountability before God to handle that which we have been entrusted with, and that's the mystery of God. The Greek word mysterion, it's all the way through the Bible. The mystery, what is the mystery of God? It's the fact that God is the creator. It's the fact that there is the fall. It's the fact there is redemption. What's that all about? We have to understand that no human being would ever have figured out logically what we know is the truth of God. And to most people, that is a mystery. And we as under rowers, as servants, as stewards of this mystery, we have to live it out and explain it. And that is that God, through thousands of years, Old Testament, working through his peculiar people and through events in history prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ who was God in human flesh, God-man in this world, his birth, his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, and his coming again to bring down the curtain of history. Now, that is the mystery that's in us that we should know. We'd be able to share it very simply. We're responsible for that. The church, I say it once again, is the container. The container of the mystery of God because all of us are bodies and arms and feet and eyes and no one more important than the other. We are to share that mystery. It's been revealed to us, and we reveal it to others. And then it says, verse 2, and in this case, moreover, said Paul, is required of stewards and under rowers that one be found trustworthy. We're to be trustworthy. In other words, we are to be men and women of truth. If anything is on the table today in the 21st century culture, it is truth. Uh, remember what Solzhenitsyn said? I quoted him a few weeks ago. Don't live on lies. We have to live on truth. And as under rowers and as stewards, we have to be trustworthy that what we say and what we endorse is true truth and we don't step back and tolerate anything else but truth. But in our society, truth is at a premium. Now, I'm going to be what some would say political here, but I'm not being political. If anyone thinks that God does not speak to contemporary life, you are too ignorant to understand anything about how the Bible operates and about the life of Jesus Christ. Who in the world were the Pharisees? Who were the Sadducees? Who were the Herodians? 
who were all these groups and they dealt, he dealt with the situation in that day and in that age. And that is exactly what we do in the church. Let me tell you something. If you're in a room and you holler fire and there's no fire, you're breaking the law. Man's law. If you're in a room and there is fire and you do not identify the fire, I think you're breaking God's law. In this church, we're not here and I'm not here as a mild-mannered man speaking to mild-mannered people how to be more mild-mannered. There's plenty of that about. That's not who we are. Some illustrations, and there's so many of them, we don't have time to enumerate them. And I will not be exhaustive in all of these and talk about every nuance. CNN, ever heard of it? This past week, it was recorded some conversation between those who decide the programs and those who oversee that and the man on top. For weeks and weeks and days and days, almost in every situation, they put the number of deaths from the coronavirus on the screen. Have you noticed it's up there? And some of the programmers said, Look, the deaths are going down. You know, let, let's, just, let's just cool this off. But the voice on high, this is all recorded. I'm paraphrasing, but being very accurate. Said, oh, no, no, no. If it bleeds, it's leads. And they said, you have to have fear or our ratings will go down. You have to export fear. People watch us. That's what they want to hear. And that's what we see. And that's what they've done. To me, that is totally immoral on the face of it. Now, we can just push that out a little bit more of things that we're dealing with here. In the event, the tragic event, when a lot of patriots went to Washington million or so, we don't know. And they were concerned about the election. In a crowd like that, you've got all kind of super sonic right-wing idiots that didn't think. And they went into the Capitol. I don't think a single one of them was found to have a gun. Funny kind of revolution with no guns. But one of the Capitol officers was killed. And the report went out, listen, and I have seen person after person after person said this Capitol officer there, he was virgin, he was hit in the head and killed by a fire extinguisher. Let me tell you something, I'm not making it up. You can record, it's all there. And Person after person after person in the media, this man was killed as a result of being hit in the head with a fire extinguisher. Now, by the way, they knew in advance that was not true. Because on the way home that night, he talked to his mother and other people, said, how are you? He said, I'm fine. And this, this week, they did an autopsy. Listen, there wasn't a mark on his head. No bruises on his body. He died that night, evidently, of a couple of strokes by the report of the autopsy. Did all of these talking heads come out and say, you know, I lied to you it's the cause of his death? Let me know when you hear that retraction. You see, what we have to teach our society, and we have to learn, something called due process. Something called wait till all the reports are in before we just run to some kind of judgment that fits the ideology that we already have as we interpret what takes place in time and in history. We must practice that. We are to be trustworthy, to speak the truth, we're called to do that as under rowers, 
as stewards of the mysteries of God. And we must do that in the 21st century. And then Paul goes on to say, too many people have a sunburn. Have you noticed that? Everybody seems to have a sunburn. Oh, don't touch me there. Hold on, hold on. Oh, I'm a redneck from Mississippi. Man, when you call me, I'm telling you, I'm up. You have harmed me so deeply, I'll never recover. A redneck from Mississippi. That's who I, oh, I've got a sunburn. And we've got, see, you, you touch somebody about anything, and oh, that upsets me, that offends me. Oh, that break. And we have all the people, all the population running around with sunburns. Have you noticed it? Sure you have. Boy, that word right there. We uh, have people who are interpreting events out of context. Take a reporter, a news person. By the way, I would love to sit in a class at one of these woke universities and hear what they're teaching those who want to be in the public eye or the news. I'd like to hear what they're saying, wouldn't you? It'd be amazing. It must be total postmodernism. For example, you bring a typical person who is report the news, printed or oral, and you take them to the Bible and say, I want to show what the Bible says. The Bible says, Judas went out and hanged himself. Oh, look at it. And then look over here, and it says, go thou and do likewise. Oh. And they would take that. And say, you know, the Bible teaches, I just read it, that we all to hang ourselves like Judas does. That's how crazy the Bible is. Did you get it? In context? In context? And so we see everybody with this sunburn, and because we've got this sunburn, we judge everybody. Like the old antique joke that I love, the man with the doctor, he said, Doc, when I touch my shoulder, oh, it hurts. When I touch my head, it's so painful. I touch my knee, it's painful. Doc, what's wrong with me? He looked, he said, you got a broken finger. I mean, it's not too hard. <laughs> I mean, my point is, we're so sensitive in our culture. We're all sunburned. I'm offended. I'm upset. You belittle me. And, and this is where we are. And here we have Paul talking to that day and to our day, say, you are all in the judgmental business. Judge not that you be not judged. All right, let's see what he talks about, three kinds of judgment. First of all, he talks about the world's judgment. Look at it in chapter 3. But to me, said Paul, it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. Verse 3. In other words, Paul says, the world examines us. In this, everybody was sunburned. Everybody so sensitive. Paul said, I don't worry about the world examining me. I don't worry about the courts examining me. That's not what I'm about. That's not who I am. He would say, continuing, I march to the beat of a higher drummer than man's judgment. But, but, there are two things you need to learn. People who will tell you and me the truth about us, two categories. One would be those who don't like us. They get mad at us. And they explode and say, you are so egotistical. Somebody doesn't like you, they'll lay it out. Then you've got to handle that criticism. Or somebody who knows you and loves you, who really cares about you, has a relationship with you, and they come and say, you are so egotistical. Now, what do you do with the world's criticism? Couple of things. Number one, whether it's your enemy or a close, intimate friend or brother, you examine it before God. You say, Lord, is there something in me, the way I live, the way I act, the way I respond, that in indicates I am really got my ego out of balance? I'm egotistical. Lord, you tell me. If there is, I want forgiveness and I want you to help me deal with it. 
whether it comes from intimate friend who loves us or comes from an enemy who doesn't like us. That's how you deal with the world's criticism. Don't throw it out, discount it. See if there is truth there and God will tell you and tell me where there's truth there and then we'll begin to deal with it with his power and with his divine insight. Got it? And then Paul says, there's another kind of judgment that comes and he says, in fact, I do not even examine myself, letter part of verse three. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. Paul, you know, the, the Athenian said, know thyself. Nobody can know themselves, really. But we can, we do judge ourselves. And Paul said, we must not do that to an extreme. Why can't you and I judge ourselves? It's because some of us overjudge ourselves and Boy, I, I've done that so many times. Boy, why did I do that? That was a little thing. And, and we judge ourselves too harshly. And by the way, when you have a low opinion of yourself in the quiet time alone or on your pillow, you've got a real problem. You've got a real problem. Some are too severe on themselves. They don't understand forgiveness and things that are covered, things are eliminated, and it keeps coming up and up and up and up in our life. We never get over it, so we're hard on ourselves. It is tough to live with somebody you know is insincere and a hypocrite every day, and sometimes we're too hard on ourselves, right? The other extreme, we're too light on ourselves. We've got our conscience trained. I love some ignoramus who says, let your conscience be your guide. You can if your conscience is embedded with biblical truth. But most of us have got that trained conscience. Oh, yeah. I can explain why I said that. I can rationalize that. Oh, I didn't really. You know, so we've got a trained conscience because we can't judge ourselves on the basis of our conscience, can we? It's either too sensitive are totally inadequate. Paul says, the world can't really judge us. He said, we can't judge ourselves. Then he tells us who does indeed judge us. Look at it, it's beautiful. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on to pass judgment, the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light Oh, this is scary. The things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives oh, 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 of our hearts and then each person's praise will come to him from the Lord. There's going to be a judgment time. Absolutely. Romans 14, Corinthians 5, passage in Matt. We're going to be a judgment time. Great white throne judgment. All that's in darkness will come to the light. How many of us look forward to that? Is that going to be a great day? Boy, I'm glad you know everything I've thought of, everything I've done in my life. Boy, it's going to be, oh, no, 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 no. Only God can judge. Now, on the side, to put it in context, isn't it beautiful that when we confess sin, turn from sin genuinely, and God is healed and forgiven, that's not going to be the agenda there. But God will go up and check our motives. Why did you give that? Why did you say that? Why did you talk about it? See, motive, that frightens me to death. You sit down by yourself and ask one question. What have I done in my life from a pure, pure, pure motive? Well, I, I love my wife. Well, was that pure? Did you have no? So my point is, motives are frightening. And only God knows the time of judgment. And he alone would reveal motives. And he'll take all that which we thought was done with and bring it out into the light. Now, we're not to judge. But by the way, that doesn't mean judgment should not take place. God has already judged some things in his book, has he not? God said, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. 
Therefore, it's not when someone lies, we don't deal with it. God has already pronounced the judgment there. Thou shalt not kill, and the word is murder, independent of capital punishment. Thou shalt not kill. God has already spoken about that. I have to worry about what that is right or wrong. So my point is, God has already pronounced these judgments, and on the ultimate judgment, he will be there in the great white throne, and he'll, he'll sort everything out because he is the only one who can sort everything out. Here's somebody who may have lived a beautiful, wonderful life. We check their motives. Whoa. Here's someone who struggled, but boy, they, they check their motives and they come out in a lot better light. Only God can do this. That's what Paul is saying. And all the sunburned folks that are walking around, that includes a lot of us, we have to understand that we're not in the judgment business. The world's judgment, self-judgment, only God can judge, and he's put that off, thank God. Now, the next thing Paul says is very, very interesting. He said, don't get ahead of your skis. That's how I get verse six. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake. Paul is saying, listen, I've applied these basic truths to myself, and now, and to Apollos, we've done it, and now I'm applying it to you. You know the hardest thing about my job? The really hardest thing about my job is to take this book and understand it and let the Holy Spirit speak, and this is a two-edged sword, and it cuts me up constantly. I bleed a whole lot because of this book. And then it cuts outward as well. And the problem is when we go beyond this book, what did Paul say here? Paul is saying he and Apollos were judged by the book that was written. That would be the Old Testament revelation. That would be the principles he laid out for the church at Corinth when he went there as their founding father. He said, don't get ahead of that. Don't, don't move on beyond that. Don't get ahead of your skis. What does that mean? I, I had about a five-minute skiing career until I, I broke a rib. But I know on skis, if you get ahead, what's going to happen? Bang! That's what he's talking about. He's saying, look, don't, don't get ahead of yourself. Stay in the center, balanced and grounded. C.S. Lewis, he said when we go in one extreme... In life, usually we find ourselves backing up into the other extreme. You follow me? There's something that we say as Christians, we ought to take everything we have and give it all away to God and live on basically nothing. I, I've fought and wrestled and thought about that many, many times. Poverty. The other extreme is I want to take all I can and make all I can, hold on to all I can. So what's the answer? You got to have sort of a grip that's not like this, I'm gonna hold it all, or not like a grip like this. There, there's a middle thing there. Another illustration, this is personal. Day by day, I run into so many people who are bleeding and hurting and crying and dying and all kind of situations. Contrary to popular opinion, they say, oh, that preacher doesn't know real life. Listen, folks, I know real life better than almost anybody here because we meet it by the dozens, by the dozens, by the dozens every day. And here's the problem. You can become so empathetic that you just weep and cry and moan and you, you pick up every flag on the field and you try to wonder what in the world to do. Man, God, I want to intercede, I want to pray, I want to be there, I want to give, and in your whole life is a brokenness. On the other hand, you can take all the problems and concerns and you can become a professional. You know, you just, you know, I don't really feel it. I've heard all this before. I've been there, done that. I'm a pro. You know, I can, see, there's two extremes, isn't it? I can't function because of all this. You know what I'm talking about. Or I function and I just put it at the table. It doesn't really mean anything to me because I'm calloused against the pain of the world. You see what happens? You go either extreme. Paul is saying, 
Stay centered. Stay centered. Stay balanced. Don't get ahead of your skis. And you're not, but not get back on your skis. That's what he's saying. And then he goes and this is, this is something. He gets in the grill of the Corinthians. What does that mean? Playing your sports, you know what it means. You ever watch any sport, you know what that means. You ever see a coach? Somebody will be going in the game or going out of the game and they grab their face mask and they get in their grill. That's what that means. And they say, son, on the last play, you didn't follow that and he just gets into them. Or they say, son, man, I believe in you. I'm sending you in for this specific purpose. You, you get there in their grill. Paul gets in the grill of the church. By the way, we misinterpret that in sports. I've been on the sidelines for many, 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 many games, all kind of sports, particularly basketball and football, and it'll fool you. You ever see a, a controversial play an official made, and the coach goes over there, and he's just flying. He gets an official. He's shaking his head like this, and boy, you say, man, that coach is telling. So many times, you know what coaches are doing? They're saying, that was a great call. I, you had so much courage to call that. You're the kind of official I wanted. See, we don't know what they're saying. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. And, and, and the point is, but Paul here gets in the grill of these Christians. And by the way, he's going to be in our grill in chapter 5. Ooh, more I dread that. He gets in the grill of these Christians. And look what he says. First of all, he has three questions that are simply satirical questions. It's full of satire. Look at it there in, in verse 7 following. Paul says, For who regards you as superior? <laughs> Why are you such a big shot? He's asking the, each one in the church. He said, What do you have that you did not receive? And he says, and if you did not receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Folks, does anybody have anything that you did not receive? Well, I worked so hard, I built, I mean, no, you didn't. Grace, the door was open, the choice was made, the decision. And so all of life is grace. Not only our redemption, our salvation, Wherever we are in life, it's just by the grace of God. We haven't earned it. We haven't deserved it. Big, little, up or down makes no difference. It's all grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's the acrostic. It's a gift. Boy, no need to be proud about anything. It's all grace. He's saying, what do you have that you did not receive? And it's interesting here. You look at the context of this. There's an advantage to being disadvantaged. Got that? There's an advantage to being disadvantaged. If you're brought up down to the bottom of the line, for some that's a challenge to move up and to give yourself and to work and to serve and get under God and make life count. See, there's an advantage to being disadvantaged. But also, when we're advantaged, that can be a disadvantage. The Lucky Sperm Club. It all came to me. Boy, that, that's a disadvantage too when you think, I deserve it, though I didn't earn it. You see, there's that balance in there. There's advantage to being disadvantaged. In disadvantagement, there's advantage. It works both ways. So Paul here is saying, wherever you are in the, in the spectrum, man, make sure you know it's a gift of God. It's that grace. And then he gets still in their grill. He's saying, you are already filled. And the word there has to do with food. He's saying, you Corinthians, you, you people there in the church, you're already filled. You have already become rich. You become kings without us. Paul said, indeed, I wish you had become kings so that we may also reign with you. See the deep sarcasm to awaken us and to awaken the Corinthians. It's by grace. And then he says, 
For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle, hold on to that word, it's a pregnant word, to the world, both to angels and to men. What's he saying? We've become a spectacle. That's who we are as Christians. When the Romans would take over and conquer a country, they would march back to Rome, and they did in other places. And the soldiers would march in unison, and bring up the rear would be all the slaves they had captured, would be all the goods they'd brought back home. So they would march at the front, and all the slaves and those who'd been caught and captured and all they had stolen from the conquests they had, they'd be all at the rear of the parade. That's the word spectacle. And Paul says, <laughs> we're at the rear of the parade. We're way, we're way back there. That's who we are as under roars, as stewards, as those who really have been useless as far as the world is concerned. And then he says, verse 10, but we are fools for Christ's sake. By the way, you go to a lot of places, hear a lot of teaching and preaching, and they're always saying, you, 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 you. Have you noticed that? You rarely hear that from me. Why? Because I need it all. I, I can't say much you. It's we. That's what Paul is doing. He's saying we. We. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. You are weak. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. What's he saying? He's saying, folks, as Christians, it's grace of God. There's evenness in the body of Christ, and we're to be fools. We're not to be prudent. In other words, Paul's saying, lay it out on the line. Be an idiot. Be, be disgraced by the world. He's saying, don't worry about your name and your reputation. Just be a fool for Christ's sake. Sell out. Go all in. And by the way, it's not going to be long before we'll be able to identify true followers of Jesus from those who are not true followers of Jesus. You just mark that down. That's a little bit of prophecy, but you don't have to be a prophet to understand that's where we are. Do you realize today that Christians are the most persecuted group in the world? Last year, over 100,000 Christians were martyred, were killed because they were Christians. Did you know that? Every hour, 11,000, 1,100, 11 people, excuse me, every hour, 11 people are martyred because they're Christians around the world. There are 239 countries, excuse me, 139 countries, about three-fourths of the countries, 139 countries, who have in their documents passages that directly discriminate against Christians. That's three-fourths of the countries of the world, roughly, 139 countries, discriminate because you're a Christian. By the way, you can add one more country, the United States of America. And it's a tragic tragic, tragic thing. So many things are backward. So many things are backward. You say, all these children are being left here without parents. Most of those children are between 14 and 17, and how do you know they're 17 or 21? And most of them come from these countries. They were gangs in that country. There's some little children. They were gangs. They're emptying all the gangs from all of these countries and push them across the border, and the coyotes take them there as they're sold, and they move right across the border, and now they're scattering them across America. And we ask, why is crime in all of our cities just exploded everywhere you look? Any statistical? Why is that happening? Why is that happening? Why is there an effort 
to take guns away from people. As all of a sudden, our DAs are just letting everybody walk through and walk out without any bail or anything else. And now they say, we'll take away your gun to protect yourself. Why are they taking the police and, and, and releasing them of any kind of power? The state of New York, I was told on this morning by a law enforcement officer, they decided that now individual policemen can be sued for any action they might do while they're trying to apprehend a deal with somebody. And last and recently, over 9,000 New York policemen in the last couple have quit their job. How can you have a job like that? And by the way, the lawyers say, hallelujah. You'll have litigation for anything you do, for a traffic stop, anything you try to do, if that right comes. Colorado's done the same thing. You won't have anybody protect us. Ah, but you take guns away from this group and you give guns to that group and that's the bottom line situation which we find ourselves in the slowly systematic evil destruction of the United States of America. Now, Paul then comes, gives us a wonderful word of how we are to handle this. First of all, he says in 13, he says, here's who I am. We're slandered. We try to conciliate. We become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even now. He, oh, oh, he's already said when we persecute, Paul's ahead of me. I'm not there. I'll have to confess to you he's ahead of me. I, I want some kind of approval and some kind of recognition. I, I want the glory of God to flow in and through our lives, but Paul's ahead of us. We're not quite there, but we're running there far too, far too rapidly. And then he says in verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Parents, we're not to shame our children. I told some men this morning I'd like a redo in being a father because sometimes I resorted to shame. Shame, we don't do that in discipline our children. We admonish them, and that is we, we speak quietly as we've counted to a thousand a couple of times. That's admonishment. Quiet voice, measured tones, not shame. And he says, Paul is saying, this is what I'm saying to you in the church. He's trying to explain that everything is by grace. And because he's given us this, we have to hold it in these earthen vessels, our bodies, and to live it out, especially now in this moment in history. Let me, Cliff Barrows, as some of you know, was a very close friend of mine. Cliff directed the music for Billy Graham all those years. He was one of the counselors of Billy Graham. Mr. Graham said, that of all the people he knew that the two best Christians were his wife, Ruth, and Cliff Barrows. Cliff called me years ago, and he said, I want to tell you what just happened to me. He was in Washington, and he said, I was walking to the hotel lobby and said, Wintley Phelps came up to me. Most of them may remember him. He's an African-American singer. He's been here many times. Beautiful voice, pastor in Washington. He said, Wintley came up and said, Cliff, I want to show you something. He said, Wintley took me there in a little side room and sat down at a piano. And he said, you may not know this, but all the spirituals, all the spirituals are written in the pentatonic key. And that means the melody is played only on black notes, all the spirituals. And he said, Wintley played for me on the piano Sweet little Jesus boy, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. All on the pentatonic key. Five in these octaves, there are five black notes. Only using the black notes to piano. He says, it is called the slave scale. And he said, the story of John Newton is interesting. He said, Newton was a slave trader. He'd been a drunk. After he was a slave trader, he fell drunk overboard into the sea once, and to get him out, they had to gaff him like you would a fish and put him back up. And before that, he'd been a slave trader on those galleys. 
And John Newton beautifully came to know Jesus Christ, (laughs) a radical change in his life of a life that was as decadent and godly and evil as any life you could imagine. And he said, as he did that, Newton, though he wasn't a musician, kept hearing the cadence that he heard on those slave ships. And he said, those slaves, as they would row, they had a mm, 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 a, a melody, music behind it. And he said, Newton couldn't get that music out of his mind. And he said, the music sounded something like And he picked it out, and he finally came to see what it was. And Whitley said that that mm, 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 was what the slaves had roared to and he simply put words on it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And you look in a hymnal sometime and you'll find something very, very interesting. Amazing grace will be listed. It'll say words by John Newton. Melody tune nobody knows I can tell you who wrote the melody it was God it was God Newton just put the words to it to emphasize that all of us are under rowers we're under rowers we're slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the beauty of the body of Christ. That's the reason the church, as I've said Sunday after Sunday, read there, 2 Peter 2, 9. We are a new race. We are a new priesthood under the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is grace And it is that grace that we contain that we must reveal in our lives and our walk. And that's the way we live in a culture that is broken. God-fearing lives under roars for him. Our Heavenly Father, we are astounded about your grace and your patience with us. We love you. May that love be expressed not only in words and vocabulary and adjectives and nouns and verbs, but in the way we live is our prayer in Jesus' name.